Today's message is entitled, Try Softer, Try Softer. If you have a Bible this morning, you can open with me to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, and then we will later get to Isaiah 40, which is an incredible passage, but uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 at the beginning. Today, as we conclude this series, I want to talk about being still not as a momentary thing or an option in any circumstances that we're in front of, but being still as a way of life as an invitation from God to live a certain kind of life before him, to be still from our day-to-day circumstances that we encounter. And I want to open with this. I have a mentor who actually lives locally, and he shared this with me some time ago, and it's just really challenged me. Every time he talks to me about it, in fact, he sent me uh, an audio of himself talking through this just the other day, and it's seven steps to failure. Aren't you excited about that? Today I want to teach you about seven steps to failure, right? No, I want to warn you about seven steps to failure. My mentor has talked to me about this so many times. He says in the life you encounter so many struggles and sometimes you deal with worries and anxieties and fears. Isn't that true? You can think in your own life just this last week, a worry or a fear, a frustration with someone else or a circumstance that's in front of you. There is a choice that we make in the midst of that moment that leads us either towards the heart of God or ultimately towards failure in our own life. And it begins like this. There's seven steps to failure. I'm going to say them quickly and you may not be able to catch all of them, but I want you to catch the bigger picture this morning. The first step to failure is to not pray or if you pray to not trust. Hear me this morning. First step to failure is to not pray about it. And if you do pray than to not trust God with what he's going to do in the midst of it. Because sometimes I can pray, God, will you take care of this? Will you do something about this? But then I go on about the way that I would have done it as if I didn't even believe in God to begin with. To not trust as if I didn't even believe that he heard me to begin with. Or in my own life and maybe in yours, I cannot even pray about some things. Well, that's the first step to failure. The second step to failure is burden bearing where I've maybe prayed about it, maybe I haven't prayed about it, but I certainly haven't trusted God about it. And I begin to bear the burdens, the weights of what's happening around me, my circumstances, the health of a loved one, what direction my child's going to take, what I'm going to do about this next job or the next financial situation. And I begin to bear the burden, and don't you? And maybe you're not even bearing your own burdens, but you might be bearing the burdens of other people, loved ones that you care about. And you begin to bear their burdens because you're not trusting God for them. And the problem with bearing burdens is that I begin to leave God out of it, and I begin to accumulate burdens. And they begin to stack upon one another. And I get down the road a little ways, and I realize I am exhausted from all the burden carrying that I'm doing. And I realize that somewhere along the lane, I've left God out of the bearing of the burdens of my own life. And I begin to bear burdens that I wasn't even created to bear. And I'm carrying all these things on my shoulders that I'm not strong enough to carry, that I might put on pretense as if I can, but I'm not made to do it from my very conception from God, that he knew he was going to carry certain burdens that I wasn't ever made to carry. So the first step is to not pray or to pray but not trust. The second step is to bear burdens. The third step is weariness. Weariness. And I'm not talking about just the end of a day, a long day, ready to get in bed. I'm talking about weariness of your soul, where your soul just gets exhausted with the burdens that you're carrying, which leads to steps four, five, and six, and it gets worse as it goes. Step four, deep discouragement. Not just like a momentary discouragement, but kind of a way of life, feeling just very discouraged about where life is going, where, how you wake up one moment in life and think, how did I get to this moment? Which leads to disillusionment. I begin to question everything. What do I believe about God? What do I believe about the people that are close to me? Maybe nobody really cares about me. Maybe my life's never going to amount to anything. Maybe I don't have any purpose left in front of me. Step six is to get disengaged or isolated which is getting more dangerous as you go, because if I begin to isolate from the people who do care about me, I begin to isolate from my relationship with God, then step seven of the seven steps to failure is disaster. And you never want to get to disaster. You want to rewind the tape and start back at the beginning and begin to do it differently from the beginning rather than showing up at the point at which you're isolated from people or you're on the cusp of a disaster. And what does disaster mean? It means that one bad choice, that one moment where somehow you arrive there and you don't even know how you got there and you made one choice to maybe to uh, hurt a loved one or to do something sinful with your life and you think, how did I even arrive here? Well, it begins 
from the very beginning with that word trust. To pray and to trust. To believe God that he wants to be in the midst of everything. And everything always goes back to trust. So God wants us simply to trust and not walk the seven steps to failure. And I'll bet all of us are in one step or another in this room. Hopefully most of us are back at the beginning or maybe we're before and we don't even take the first step. We're praying and we're trusting. And if we pray and we trust, then we don't ever have to walk the rest of the road. But if you're praying but not trusting, then you have to begin to watch out. Or if you're not praying at all, and let's talk about that this morning. If you're not praying at all about the things that are worrying your heart, that are, you're staying up late at night, or that you're bearing burdens around, then that should be a red alarm. Go no further, right? Do not pass go. Do not collect $200, right? Just stop there and to say, God, I know I'm burden bearing in this area of my life, and so I'm going to stop and I'm going to begin to pray. And God, if I have trouble trusting you, will you give me the faith to trust you in a way that I don't trust on my own? I'm going to pray, Lord, I'm going to lean into you, and I'm going to ask you to get involved and to go before me and to protect me from behind and fight my battles on, on, on my behalf. And personally, I have to say in my own life, I've seen this cycle over and over and over again. And by God's grace, I don't often go past number three in the journey, but I'm often at one, two, and three. And I wish I wasn't even at one, two, and three, but I was back at the beginning where God has created me to be, at a place of trust and prayer. But often I find myself not praying or praying and still doing it in my power and getting tired and getting discouraged along the way. And God then often, by his grace, wakes me up and says, you know why you're feeling this way? It's because you're not praying about the things you're worried about. I say, God, thanks for the reminder. And that's just my journey. And maybe that's the journey of many in this room. And yet Jesus has invited us to a different kind of life. In fact, he's gathered with his disciples at some point, and the crowds are around him. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he gives this great promise, this great invitation he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I'll bet some of you need to hear that this morning. Come to me, all you who are weary and burden. I love to just start there. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. That's the invitation from Jesus. Not just for them in that day, but the invitation for every person everywhere. And not just for certain people. You see that word he uses? All you. Everyone who is burdened and weary. What does he say? He says, come to me. He doesn't say, fix it on your own. He doesn't say, deal with your own problems. You got yourself into it. You can get yourself out. He says, come to me if you're burdened and weary, and I will give you rest. Which for some of us might be a decent night's sleep from time to time. Maybe that's the kind of rest that God needs to give us in the short run. Because we're struggling. We're looking at the ceiling in the middle of the night thinking, well, is life going the direction I thought? Or what's going to happen with this health thing that's in front of me? And God says, look, I can give you a rest in those moments. But Jesus is talking about a deeper rest, isn't he? He says, I will give you rest for your souls. Meaning, I want your heart to be at peace. And I don't know where everybody is spiritually here this morning, but the beginning of that journey is not just in your circumstance. The beginning of the journey is just knowing and our relationship with Jesus Christ because he gives us rest for our souls. Our souls are thinking, well, I don't know where my life is going. I don't know what happens beyond eternity. I don't know. I've done some bad things and, and I don't know how to deal with it. God gives rest through forgiveness. God gives rest through giving us a promise of eternity to be with him. That's the kind of rest that we need most. But even for those of you that have been walking with Jesus for some time, you know and I know that we can have that kind of rest kind of nailed down. I know I'm going to be in eternity with Jesus and believe that. And that gives us great hope. But we can live each day restless, can't we? And Jesus says, I want to give you eternal rest long term, at the end of life rest. But I also want to give you rest now. Which doesn't mean that you're not going to have activity in your life, that you're not going to have things on your plate, not that you're going to not have any challenges in front of you, but it means that I can give you peace in the midst of the activity, that I can give you a sense of calmness and stillness in the midst of everything that's around you. So Jesus comes to them and says, look, I know you're weary and you're burdened, so come to me. 
and he will come to me, then I will give you rest. And he says at the end, look, the life is hard. The way of the world is hard. It, you will be weary. You will be burdened. There will be things come your way that you don't know how to handle. And you're going to be challenged by them. And they're going to be discouraging. But he says, my way is different. He says, my way is easy. And my burden is light. Which doesn't mean that he doesn't have things he asks us to do with our life. Of course he does. He calls us to obedience and a certain kind of living and saying yes to some things and no to other things. Of course that's the way of Jesus. But he says, if you will walk in my way, it won't be like the world's way, which is burdensome and wearisome and doesn't have hope at the end of the journey. But if you will walk in my way, there's a certain amount of lightness to it and ease to it that the rest of the world can never give you. And it's through your hope in Christ and what he wants to do in your life, and how he's going to see you through every problem, and the fact that he goes before you. And so Jesus says, look, my way's different. The ways that you've learned from the world is one way, but my way is different. My way is easy and light and burdenless for your life, right? So he says, you don't have to walk seven steps to failure. You can just walk towards me. And if you walk towards me, then I will take care of all the needs that are around you. A couple years ago, uh, probably a good five or six years ago, I was out at my family's house in California, and we were sitting around around New Year's. And we were sitting there and just talking, and I think it was New Year's Day or maybe the day after that, and we were, I can still picture the moment in uh, my folks' living room, and we were sitting there, and we were talking about New Year's. And I said, do you guys have any New Year's resolutions? And there was a little bit deer in the headlights. Everybody was thinking about it, and so they said, well, you know, this is, how you, this is a stall tactic. You say, well, what's your New Year's resolution? Back to me. When in doubt, just say that to somebody. You know, just reverse the question. I'll give you a little time to think. And so I said, you know what? I don't know what makes me think it, but I think this next year I need to try softer. And they're like, I've heard of try harder, but I've never heard of try softer. And I said, I haven't either. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but I think God wants me not to try harder I think he wants me to try softer in my own life. It had been a busy year, and honestly, I feel like I had been trying to force some good things to happen. I'd been trying to push that ball up the hill, like try to make progress, and I was having trouble making progress in our personal life and in our ministry and what God was doing. And I felt like everything was just harder than it was supposed to be, but I was going to just push through, right? And there is a time to push through some challenges in front of you. I felt like God was saying to me, God, Brad, I don't need you to push any harder than you're pushing. I don't need you to try any harder than you're trying. Enough is enough. I need you just to rest and my ability to take care of what's in front of you. And I need you to try softer. And I thought to myself that day and just replaying the tapes, you know, you can think and you can say something in a moment and it's like it slows down and you think about it deeply. And I've been thinking about this phrase that just came off my lips in a moment for years now. But this idea that I think God wants Brad to try softer in his life and not to try harder. To not be so weary or burden-bearing or discouraged by my own effort, but instead to be encouraged that his effort will see me through everything that's in front of me. And I know there's different people in this world. I said a couple weeks ago, there's someone they encounter a challenge, sit on the couch and go, I think it's going to be fine. There's others when they encounter, encounter a challenge, they get moving faster, you know, like more activity springs out of their life. And I'm probably more in the second of those camps than the first. I'm more likely to try to go solve it and fix it than to just sit and rest in the moment. And, and there may be pros and cons to both, right? Sometimes if I was prone to sit on the couch, God would be like, I just need you to get off the couch. I need you to try harder, right? He might say that to me. But because I'm an active person, and some of you are active people, and some of you like to fix things, and some of you, more than that, bear the burdens of what's happening around you and get weary in the midst of it, I think God has something different to say to us. And it's not that I need you to work harder or try harder. It's that I need you to try softer. And the truth is, I know in my own life, that God wants me to work hard. I think working hard honors God. It takes care of the needs in front of me. But I don't need to work so hard that I'm dependent on myself to solve things. To never be under the illusion that somehow I'm at the center of what needs to happen. Instead, I'm a bystander watching God move in my life. That's what God wants me to do. He wants me to be involved and do what he says, but he ultimately wants me to sort of stand to the side and get out of his way, doesn't he? 
and just say, Brad, I just sort of want you for this season to watch me work. Because if you'll watch me work, then you will be amazed at just how good I am, how detailed I am, how knowledgeable I am about everything that's in front of you. And he says to me sometimes, and maybe he says to you as well, would say to you today, I just need you to take a step back rather than a step forward. I need you to let me get in front of you and you get behind me. And if you'll get behind me, then you'll watch me part the seas in front of you so that you can walk on dry ground. What does trying softer mean? Trying softer means I let God do the burden bearing. I let God do the burden bearing because he has big shoulders, right? He created the whole universe and he can hold it in his hands. Certainly he can bear the problems that are are crushing me in the moments that I'm around in right now. He can bear my burdens. He wants to bear my burdens. He wants to bear the burdens that I have for others who I feel like their life is off track or I don't know what's going to happen or I don't know how to help them and I wish that I could but I don't know what to do. He wants me to bear that burden. He wants to bear the burdens that I have in my own life, those things that I'm worried about and anxious about, maybe even the things that I'm not telling anybody else about but I know what they are and you know what they are as well, right? He says, I want you to let me bear those burdens. And I've done this sometimes in my own life, and I don't do it as often as I need to, but sometimes I will literally take my hands and I'll put them on my shoulders and I say, God, this weight that I'm feeling, I'm going to take it and I'll, I'll give it to him as though he's standing in front of me. And I'll pray through them one by one. This thing, Lord, I'm going to take this burden and I'm going to give it to you. And I'll do it physically because it makes me feel like I'm really doing it, right? It's like my heart's really changing in the moment. God, this thing that I'm burden-bearing, I'm going to give this to you. And I know you can handle it because you have big shoulders. Trying softer means that I reject the temptation to force things or strive in my own effort to make things happen. Say, God, I'm done with forcing and pushing in directions that only you can make things happen. Instead, I'm going to stand back and I'm going to let you be the force behind what's in front of me. And last but not least, try and softer. And this may be the hardest. It means that I learn to wait. And I wait on God and I wait on God's timing. Hear me this morning. I'm going to wait on God's timing for things that I'm praying for, hoping for, believe that God's going to do. But I'm going to wait on his timing and I'm going to wait on his method Because often his method and his timing is completely opposite of what I'm expecting, what I'm hoping for. And we as a people, we don't like to wait. Do you like to wait? I mean, we have Amazon Prime at home. (laughs) And when it takes like two two days and an hour, I'm like calling them. Where is it? We don't like to wait. We like to stream movies automatically. We want our internet to work right away. We don't like to wait for things. We go to fast food restaurants, right? And we're like, we see the clock ticking in the window. We're like, it's taking you four minutes to make my dinner. (laughs) We don't like to wait. But waiting is critically important to the pursuit of Jesus. Waiting on his timing, waiting on his methods, waiting on him to see it through the way that he wants to see it through. It's critical. And so I say, God, I don't want to be a burden bearer. You didn't make me to be a burden bearer. I, don't, I can't be in charge of the timeline. I've got to wait on your timeline. And I've got to reject the temptation to force and strive. And I want to say from my heart to yours, it seems like trying softer is the easy road. But I just want to say in my own life, that's the harder road in the near run. It's the better road in the long run but it's a harder road in the short run where I say, God, it's hard for me to try soft or it's easy for me to try to like get out there and do it in my strength. And he says, but, and your strength's not going to get it done, Brad. Like you can't see it through the way that it needs to be seen through. I need you to depend on me and to try softer. So how does a person end up doing something like this? How does someone find the hope and the direction to be able to live this kind of life, and that's what I'm talking about today, a be still kind of life, a try softer kind of faith and belief in God, the circumstances around us. Well, this is an incredible passage in Isaiah 40, one of my favorite passages in the book of Isaiah. I learned the end of it 
uh, when I was a kid, and some of you will recognize it by the time we get to the end today. Isaiah 40 is a message of hope to God's brokenhearted people. In fact, Isaiah 40 opens with verse 1. It says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. He says to Isaiah, I need you to comfort my people because they're brokenhearted. And why are they brokenhearted? They're brokenhearted because they see the armies of the world are getting closer and closer to their land. They know that what's coming their direction looks insurmountable, and ultimately destruction is on their doorstep. Exile, meaning they're going to be kicked out of the land, is on their doorstep. But God says in the midst of it, I know I'm telling you the bad things are coming your way, but I want you also to know comfort is coming right behind it. So he begins to speak about comfort in Isaiah chapter 40, and then he begins to talk about this foundation, and we've talked about this this series. Who is God? And he lists over and over again throughout the chapter 40, about how powerful God is, how wise God is, how sovereign God is. And then in chapter 40, verse 25, in the passage that I want to read this morning, he continues. This is how we figure out how to live a be still kind of life. So hear this this morning. He says to the people, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. I just want to stop there to begin with. He starts with this idea to lift up your eyes. He says, I know you see trouble coming. I know there's struggle on the way. I know that you might be trying to figure out how to fix it on your own. But I want you to stop for a moment. I want you to think about who I am. He says, I want you to lift up your eyes. Now, my little boy, Levi, loves to talk about the universe, talks about the stars in the sky, and here's some things I was telling him the other day. There are over 5,000 visible stars in the universe. Now, I can't see them all, and most of you can't see them all, but technically they're visible if you look up at the sky. That's why people over time have studied all the stars in the sky and being be able to figure out all these constellations, and 5,000 stars is a lot. My little boy's like, wow, that's amazing, 5,000 stars, just like our sun. Some are bigger, some are smaller, but they're all out there shining our direction. And Isaiah opens with this idea to lift up your eyes and look at all these stars. Who created all these? Who brings them out one by one? Well, I was looking further, not only are 5,000 stars visible, there are over 400 billion, this is how many we've counted so far, 400 billion stars just in the Milky Way. And they're thinking there might be millions, if not billions, of, uni- of galaxies out there just like the Milky Way. And so you do the math. I can't do that math. That's a lot of stars. And he says to them, I know you have problems and I know you have fears, but I just want you to stop and lift up your eyes to the heavens. Who created all these stars? He is the one that's in the midst of your struggles and your problems. That he calls them all by name. He brings them out one by one. This is the God who's watching over your life. And you think, if I don't do something about it, no one will do something about it. And God says, I created billions upon billions of stars. I can certainly bear the burdens that are in your life. And they're not insignificant, but they're small in comparison to my ability and my power to take care of them. And so God would say to us, and where he starts in Isaiah 40, about how to be, live a be still kind of life, how to try softer. You've got to start with who God is. And if you are struggling in the moment, go out at night and look up, right? Maybe you take your burdens and do what I did and say, God, I'm going to give this to you. Or maybe sometimes you just need to go back outside and be reminded. The God that you serve set all that in motion. And he can take care of your life as well. Verse 27, he goes on. Why do you complain, it should say, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? He comes all out of what we just said. Why would you say your way is hidden from the Lord? Or my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard the Lord? He is the everlasting God. He is the creator of the ends of the earth, and he will not grow tired or weary in his understanding. No one can fathom. And so they were struggling with what we struggle with. They say, I think God God doesn't know what I'm going through. My 
My way, what I'm going through, is hidden from the Lord. He can't see it. So why would you say that after knowing that he created all that's around us? Or why would you say my cause is disregarded by my God when God doesn't disregard you? He doesn't overlook you. He doesn't cease to think about you. I love the message version of this verse. It says God, the people are saying of their own wording, God has lost track of me. He doesn't care what happens to me. And Isaiah, God through Isaiah the prophet says, is that true? Is that truth? Or is that untruth? Is that what God has said? Is that what's actually true? Or is that just what you're thinking in your own heart, in your own mind? He says, the one who set all things into being, your way is not hidden from him. Your cause, your, your problems is not disregarded as though he's kicked it to the side and doesn't care about it. He cares deeply about it. And he's not like a human who gets tired, it says. So if the Lord doesn't get tired... He doesn't get weary like you get weary or other people get weary or people who promise like, I'm going to stand beside you. No matter what you go through, I'll be there for you. And then they have trouble standing beside you in the way that they really want to, even in their own heart. And God says, look, I don't get tired. I don't get weary. I'm not like people. I don't have a beginning and end. I'm everlasting. I'm the creator of all things. That's who I am. And as a result of that, then you can begin to live a different kind of life. And then verse 29 these great, well-known verses at the end of Isaiah 40, these promises of God. He says, in light of all this, he gives strength to the weary. This is who he is. And he increases the power of the weak. He says, even youths grow tired and weary, and young men, they stumble and they fall. But those who wait upon the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and they will not grow weary. They will walk and they will not be faint. How many of you maybe grew up around the church? I know that's not the case for everyone. How many of you memorized a couple of those verses as a kid? Maybe went to like a VBS or something and learned verses. That's where I learned those verses for the first time at a VBS. I actually didn't go to VBS that much as a, as a kid. I don't know if my parents totally knew about it, but I remember going to one and learning at the end of that week, we had to memorize those last verses. But those who wait upon the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is his promises, church. Wherever you are in your relationship with God, this is what God wants for you. He says, if you're weary, come to me and I will give you rest. If you will come to me and you will rely on who I am, then I will renew your strength when you have no strength. When you're feeling weak, then I will replace it with my strength. And I will embolden you to tackle what's in front of you, not in your own strength, but in my strength and my power working through you. So Isaiah 40 would say, look, this is the promise. You don't need to try harder, or if you're weary, just just uh, struggle a little bit more in your life. You need to just come to me and let me renew your strength and what's inside of you. And those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength and they will soar on wings like eagles. I brought a picture this morning of an eagle just in case we missed the picture here this morning that I'd like to put on the screen. Eagles are incredible creatures, aren't they? I think about different birds, and I was thinking about it this week. You know, you think about the hummingbird and how much motion. And hummingbirds are amazing in their own right for different reasons, but there's so much activity around a hummingbird, isn't there? Or you think about a bumblebee, and you just think, and one was like chasing us around dinner the other night or something that looked like a bee, and we weren't sure, and we're like, you know, go away, go away, but it just kept chasing us around, and my kids are freaking out and crying and all those things. And you see all that activity in a bumblebee. But there's something different about an eagle, right? who can fly so much higher and so much further and yet has so much less activity when they fly, where they can get up into the heights and then they can stretch their wings out and just catch the wind and fly. And when I look at this picture of this eagle, you know what I don't picture of the eagle is him trying very hard. Is he? I mean, he's doing some things. He's got some activity, but he's just got outstretched arms and full belief and trust that he can fly. And I was thinking to myself, this is the picture of what God wants for his people. That we don't have to be like the hummingbird or the bumblebee, as amazing as those creatures are. But we can be like the eagles. He says it. 
if you'll just stretch out your wings, I can help you to fly. Which doesn't mean you're going to solve every problem that's in front of you, that everything's going to go easy for your life in every moment, but it means that that can be the heart that's inside of you in the midst of whatever circumstances around you. And look, I know that's challenging. And I don't want to oversimplify it. Just go out there and act like everything's going to be okay. I get it. But God says to us, I want you to look to the heavens because the same one who set the stars in place knows your problems, knows your struggles, and can bear your burdens. And he can help your heart to be still and give you fresh strength for today. As I close the message here this morning, I want you to imagine if our lives were lived in such a way that uh, we lived more like the eagle, more still, more calm, more at peace than we generally do. I want you to imagine how that would change your life, your circumstances, the challenges that are in front of you right now. If in your heart you just believed at your core that God was going to carry you, how would that change you? I think in my core, if I really believe it, and I do believe it, but I've believed it to like my fingertips. If I believed it, it would change my activity. It would change my prayer life. It would change my weariness. It would begin to work against discouragement right, and disillusionment. It would cause me just to sit back and believe, God, when you say move, I will move. And when you say stop, I will stop, knowing that you are over all things in my life, and you are in control. And it would allow me to truly try softer with the rest of my life rather than try harder, to be still rather to, than to be uh, hurrying around, striving in life. And I believe that's what God wants for you. And wherever you are here this morning in relationship with God, God wants you to encounter him, whether that's the first time or maybe that's the hundredth time or the thousandth time to re encounter him again, and as you do, and as you have a bigger belief in who he is, then you'll have less of a need to do it in your own strength, and that is the hope of the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel. That you don't even have to earn God's favor. God loves you and cares for you, and he's going to ask you to do certain things and stop doing certain things to walk away from sin, but ultimately you know you're safe and you're still in the arms of God, and he loves you completely. He'll never love you any more than he already does or any less based on your behavior, that he wants to walk with you through every single season that's in front of you. And that's the hope that Jesus has for each of you and for me. And whatever is going on in your life this morning, I just want to say, give that to God, right? Give that to him. Go out tonight when the stars are up and see how many you can count. I'll bet you don't get past 100 or 200 if you're really. There is so much more to God than we could ever ask for or imagine. That's just who he is. And that's what he is towards us. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together as we close this series.